All right, now this is 3.10, and it's called Conformational Analysis of Monosubstituted Cyclohexanes. So if I'm talking about monosubstituted cyclohexanes, how many substitutions do I have? Just one, that's right. No, this doesn't mean that this thing's got mononucleosis. No, this thing just means that there's one substituent on this ring. Okay, CH3 is pointing up, CH3 is equatorial here. Now, what I wanted to point out, I'm trying to hide it with my hand right here, okay? Look at the two concentrations of both, because we can measure this using different types of spectroscopy. Look at the concentrations of these two. This one over here is 5%. This one over here is 95%. Why? Okay, whenever I say that type of question, there's something that should immediately pop to your mind. That, that thing that pops to your mind is, ah, I'm in organic chemistry. And the second thing that pops to your mind is, well, which one's more stable, right? So if this one's 95%, that's right, it means it's more stable, right? This one means it's less stable. Now the question you want to ask yourself is, okay, so if this one's more stable, why is this one less stable? Or why is this one over here the more stable? More stabler, like Ken Stabler, NFL pro, old NFL pro, okay? But this is a CH3 sticking out this position, CH3 coming up here. Axial versus equatorial. Why is one worse? Remember those diaxial interactions I taught you? Those are the ones that have a definite impact on what's happening here. Now if you look at these two drawings here, all right, this is the axial position. This is doing an eclipsed interaction with each one of these hydrogens. And when you have that kind of eclipsed interaction, that's going to be bad, especially if something is the size of methyl. Look what happens to methyl. If you think about it as a space-filling molecule, the space-filling form here in the CH3 is going to be large enough that it's going to start pushing on those hydrogens. Anytime you have that kind of steric push, it's going to make something less stable, right? So this is pushing over here. It doesn't like pushing. It doesn't like all this energy that has to be going in to keep this thing in its axial form. So it does what anything in nature does. It adopts the lower energy conformation. And that's this one over here. What's the diaxial interaction I've got? The 1-3 diaxial interaction. 1, 3 over here with this hydrogen, 1, 3 over here, okay? The van der Waals radii, okay, which is the electron orbits, how much space they occupy, is going to be much larger on this CH3 than it is going to be on any of the hydrogens, okay? So now I want you to ask yourself the question, what's bigger, CH3 or bromine? Well, bromine, it's bigger on the periodic table, Dr. Wayne. Yes but it's only one atom. It doesn't have any bonds. Those bonds are taking up a lot of space. And in doing so, to take up a lot of space, this is going to be much larger. So anytime you have something that's got a larger overall radius due to bond formation, it's going to trump anything that might be an atom. Okay? And that's something like bromine. All right? Okay. So let's do the next problem, 3.8. Just point this out for you. Okay? 3.8 is a methyl group at C6 that is down, axial or equatorial. That is down, all right? Because there's two relationships here. Look at, oh, why did they pick 6? Six? 6 is so hard to get to. I'm going to change this to C1, because I can do that, because I'm wearing a yellow shirt. Yay, yellow shirt! Okay, if a C... C6, a methyl group that is down on C1, remember I'm changing this, the methyl group's over here, okay, it's this direction, and there's one pointing up. Now why is that the case? Alright, this one that is down is equatorial, right? But it's down respect to, with respect to the hydrogen that's sticking up. Always remember that. There's two things that are going to be on these carbons. There's one that's pointing up that's axial, or, or not necessarily axial, but there's one that's up relative to the other thing that's on top of it, okay? So if I look at C2, I've got two. I've got the equatorial and the axials pointing down, okay? In this case, if I put CH3 on the, on the second carbon, this one is pointing down with respect to the hydrogen that's coming off here, okay? So always think about these things as up and down. Whatever one's up, pointing up, north pole, okay? That one compared to whatever's below that. That wouldn't be the one that's down. All 
right? This is an important distinction. So let's look at A, a methyl group at C6, okay, I'll change it back now, that is down axial or equatorial, okay? So if it's pointing down, I've got one that's pointing down here from C6 and one that's pointing equatorial. Which one's down? Even though this is equatorial, the other one's pointing down, so that means that the down position is going to be the methyl group. When you would think about these things, just look at the vertex. That's what I do, okay? Is this thing pointing down? And yes, that's going to be the axial position. This thing pointing up, that's the axial position. Then look at whatever is attached to it, whatever is equatorial to those two things, and determine whether that's going to be up or down, okay? So let's look at B. Is a methyl group that is up at C1 more or less stable than a methyl group that is up at C4? Okay, C1, if I have a CH3 that's up, that's axial, remember, those axial positions, one, three diaxial interactions exist, that's going to make it less stable. So this is less stable, okay? At C4 is methyl group that's up. I've got an axial that's pointing down and an equatorial that's up with respect to whatever's pointing down around it, okay? So this thing over in this position, this methyl group, is going to be equatorial. Remember, equatorial positions here are going to produce less strain. So as a result, the C4 uh, methyl group that is in the up position is going to be more stable than one that's in the axial position on C1. So if you place a methyl group at C3 in its most stable orientation, is it up or down? Whichever one is not axial will be your answer. This one's pointing up, axial. So that's the least stable. The one going to the equatorial position should be the most stable. Okay, and sure enough, it will. When a methyl group is axial, each path mimics the gauge formation of the butane. All right? So here's the gauge position of butane. It looks like this. It looks like kind of like a W, the beginnings of a W here. All right? So W. And if it's in the minimal gauge conformation or, or equatorial, it's going to be this position. It's going to be more stable. If I take it away from that position, I've got axial bonds. All right? The energy difference that's down here, the energy difference between the equatorial and the axial position, um, depends on the size of the atom that's there. The larger it is, the more energy it's going to take to keep those things in the axial position. Okay? So, well, look at that. All right, remember what I said about individual atoms? This one is a fluorine that's axial, and this one over here is a fluorine that's equatorial. Why is it 4060 now? The reason being that fluorine is just a single atom. It is bigger than hydrogen, but it's not that much bigger. Okay, it doesn't fill up as much space. So yes, it's more stable. If it was a bromine, again, it would be very close to these two numbers. All right? But once I get something that's got a lot of covalent bonds, all right, a lot of covalent bonds that I've got up here, this is the T-butyl group. All right, look at these CH3s that are orbiting this carbon. Imagine the space filling model of this thing. It's gigantic, okay? It's got this giant ball right around here. And that's going to be pushing against those hydrogens. And when it does that, it's going to make it far less stable. And you can see by the, the, by the uh, percentages, this one is 0.1% and this one is 99.9%. So whenever you see something like this on a test, where we've got a T-butyl group in an equatorial position, what we've done is we've locked this cyclohexane into that position to prevent it from doing any sort of chair inversion. Because the chair inversion is going to be unpopular because in doing so, it's going to make something that is far less stable. All right? So this is a locked position with the T-butyl. I'm preventing chair inversions. Okay? I think that's it. Let's see. Yeah, there's, little, there's something here on the equilibrium constant. Feel free to read that if you want. It's a nice reminder of why these things are important. Okay, thermodynamics and entropy in this case.